<laughs> the Cleveland Browns have made their choice. Freddie Kitchens out as head coach. He was in over his head. There, there's no other way of describing it. And it's not his fault. They elevated him to be the head coach because they wanted to see the progress out of Baker Mayfield. And the problem is... is How'd that work? Well, in, in, in Freddie Kitchens' defense, Baker wasn't as good this year. I, I hope, he, I hope oh, for 100%. his sake, for his future, he can look in the mirror and, and actually diagnose the fact that he was their biggest problem. He was. Because yeah. even in a clean pocket, he didn't play as well as he did as a rookie. And he had more talent out around him on the outside. Now, the offensive line wasn't as good, but that's something that he can negate or he can at least help improve with some of his decision-making, which was bad this year. So it, it didn't help that Freddie Kitchens wasn't getting help from the guy he was supposed to help build up. All that being said, for a guy to take over the head coaching position <clears throat> while also having to call plays, that's two separate jobs. Yeah, Th- That's why you hire a head coach, and usually that head coach manages the team and then you've got a play caller because it, it's too hard to take on both those, especially it's if, if it's your first time. Like I remember when Josh McDaniels took over for Mike Shanahan for the Denver Broncos. And you can go back and look at just how overwhelmed he was from the standpoint of, one, he had personnel control, which is a whole separate deal. On top of that, he was the head coach handling all those responsibilities, and he was the play caller. It, it overwhelmed him. It, it became too much, at least for the first time around. And he ended up, you know, moving on and going back to New England. So it, it's, to me, it's it's not overly surprising. I think the only surprising thing is that Jimmy Haslam's willing to pay three head coaches now. Well, I mean, if I you're mean, paying two, what's an extra one? Right. You know? No, and, and, that's, and that's where, like, people, I hope when they're listening, they understand when players hold out or players want to try to get a bigger piece of the pie or the money. Understand this. These owners are making so much money. They can pay guys to not coach. Freddie Kitchens will make more money not coaching for the Cleveland Browns. Hugh Jackson will probably make more money not coaching for the Cleveland Browns than they would have if they actually coached out and finished out their contract. So it, it's that's how much money these owners are making. So it's not the players who are being greedy about stuff. It's the owners. But that's that's neither here nor there. I would just ask this. Go get a guy. Like go get like like last year, did they even interview Mike McCarthy? I heard that they interviewed Mike McCarthy, but the reason that he that the hire wasn't made is because they were adamant that he retained Freddie Kitchens. Like imagine the Cleveland Browns telling a guy who's one of thirty two in the history of planet Earth to win a Super Bowl as a head coach. The Cleveland Browns saying, Hey, listen, this is on our terms and if you want it if I were Mike McCarthy, I'd say, kiss my ass. What, what is this? I think he did. Yeah. I mean, it's, why he's no, it's why he's not the head coach. Maybe they'll give him another look this year or come back around. But if I was Jimmy Haslam and D Haslam, his wife, who they're part of that, that decision-making, take yourself out of it. I mean, I don't know if they trust John Dorsey to be a part of this process, if they felt like he kind of pushed them to Freddie Kitchens in making this decision or if he maybe directed them a certain way because I've heard that they're not done. And usually when the head coach is gone, that means everyone else in the staff is. Right. So if they're not done, who else would that mean? John Dorsey? He's actually built up a pretty good roster. Yeah. So the, the problem comes down to the culture. They have no culture there. They haven't had a culture since they came back in 1999. And, and that's, that's the issue is if they don't figure out a way of having a coach in there longer than one year or two years, you're never going to be able to build a culture. That's, that's the biggest issue with this team. Like The Browns can never get over the hump. It's not because they don't have talent. It's because when adversity hits, they have nothing to fall back on. Like You look at the Eagles. The Eagles have culture. Yep. When Doug Peterson took over, he developed culture. He took kind of what was there, and he also made it into something more. And that's why, what was the past three off, the past three end of the seasons? Yep. They, they're in a playoff mode already because they got to win, and they figure it out. Even with a bare bones skeleton crew of receivers, and, and the Eagles have dealt with major injuries every single year. It was their their starting quarterback who was playing like the MVP of the league the first year. They won a Super Bowl. They lose their starting quarterback again last year. They win a playoff game, and you can argue Philly should have beat New Orleans in that playoff game if a ball didn't go off Alshon Jeffrey's hands. And then the injuries this year. I've never seen a team deal with the injuries, and yet here they are in the postseason again. And I got news for you, and and we'll hit on the playoffs later on i don't want to face philadelphia in the postseason i mean you don't don't want to have to go on the road in the postseason bottom line yeah and so i just like the browns you've talked about this before which i thought was interesting because i'm a firm believer that if if you are in an environment that breeds negativity 
you've got to do something to get outside that environment or else it's going to bog you down. You may not notice it at first, and maybe it'll take a little bit off you from day to day, but ultimately you you can be, succumb to the negativity in the building and in the room. I'm a firm believer in that. You've talked about how being excited, getting to Cleveland, and there was just a mood there. Like there was just a mood there that, okay, doom and gloom. Like that still persists, doesn't it? Yeah. No, it hasn't changed. because, And the hard thing is – is it's not even – I can't say even so much that it's the people because there's a lot of good people who have been around that organization for a while and they want what's best for the team. The The problem is is they – once once they see adversity or once they see a few losses here or there, it becomes here we go again. Yep. Like that's their mantra. That's their attitude. And until they allow – one, you got to get the right person in there to be able to kind of see them through that course and not panic and not have these issues. I mean, for example – Baker Mayfield, I believe it was before the game, if you saw him kind of barking yeah. back at fans. Yeah. You know, a lot of that kind of falls on Freddie Kitchens because not only is it that was specifically the reason why he became the head coach, but it's also about him kind of building that environment or culture that where your starting quarterback doesn't do this. He learns from that, and he's still doing it. So either either Baker didn't respect Freddie enough or Freddie didn't put enough attention into those sorts of things, realizing that in this day and age that kind of stuff matters. And so until they find someone who can go in and who can figure out how to guide this ship through some rough waters and rough times, because say what you want about the roster and next year and all this stuff, they're still a losing football team. Bottom line is, it has not changed. And it, and it sucks for me to like go back and look at this because you know the last time they were a winning football team was what when my rookie season, we were 10-6, and six, yeah. and we still didn't make the playoffs. And, and it's, it stinks to kind of see this organization still in the same exact spot it was 12, 13 years ago, whatever you want to call it at this point. I mean, they're a more talented roster this year than last year, right? There's not even, yeah. they're, they're the one of the most talented and, rosters in the NFL. And they regressed. Like, they're a worse football team than they were a year ago. And and look, the Mike McCarthy story, it, it reeks of what happened in San Francisco. When when the situation happened with Jim Harbaugh and, and Trent Baalke and whatever was going on there with ownership and they moved on, like Adam Gase, like the story was Adam Gase was a strong candidate for the gig, and they told him, if you want the job, you've got to keep Jim Tom Sula as your defensive coordinator. He said, no, I want Vic Fangio. They said, no, take it or leave it. He left it. Jim Tom Sula got the job. He was there a year. Then they went to Chip Kelly. He was out after a year, and then they finally figured it out and hired Kyle Shanahan. Like once you start down this road, man, like good luck steering it back onto the tracks. You know what the difference was, though? Remember the the length of the contracts they signed both yes. Kyle and John Sue six years. Um, immediately, if you looked at what Jed York did, he he said, "I'm just going to go ahead and throw this out there. I, don't, I know it's going to look bad in the beginning, and there was a lot of pressure on Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch coming into this year. Remember, because they haven't really been healthy, they haven't succeeded to the level they thought they would, and I think people were starting to get kind of antsy that maybe this was a bad idea. But now we're seeing the fruits of their labor yeah. now that they're actually healthy, and we're seeing like what they're capable of." And that's what Cleveland needs to do. But again, I, I just I don't know if I trust Jimmy Haslam or D Haslam to make that decision. At, at this point, if you look at their track record, it's ridiculous. They fired two coaches now who've only been a head coach for one year. <laughs> like, I mean, honestly, like, I don't even know what to compare it to. It'd be like buying a car and turning around the next day and be like, eh, not feeling it. <laughs> not feeling it. It's not a lemon. There's nothing wrong. I just, I drove it around for a few hours. But I'll still make the payments. Yeah. Don't worry, everybody. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'll like, still I'm, I'm going to keep paying it for the next year. Just take it back. I, I don't want it. it. Oh, man. It doesn't even make sense. It, it, it's, but I, I can tell you this, and I know this for a fact, and anybody who's a Cubs fan, growing up a Cubs fan, I can tell you this. You always, the, there was always a vibe inside Wrigley Field and I remember when they were in the World Series against the Indians, I talked about it on the air. I said, the best thing the Cubs can do is get out of that morgue. Because in Wrigley Field, when they're losing in a playoff game, I mean, you may as well look for dead bodies and toe tags. It is a morgue. It's negative. It's depressing. Here we the go lighting again. is depressing. And once they got out of there, all of a sudden they played better. They won three or four on the road, and they won a World Series. Because there was a different vibe. It's palpable. You can feel it. And you just see Odell Beckham, even when he was on the bad Giants, his mood this year, he's not having the outburst with the kicking nets, but doesn't he seem like he's miserable? Like it just fe- it's just it got a miserable feel f- to it, even when you're just watching on television. I don't know how much of that, too, was the environment there in Cleveland or just him not being healthy. 
You know, when you're not feeling yourself and you start to get worn down physically, it, it, I mean, I think people who battle pain, whatever job you do, especially if it's labor intensive, and tell you me deal about with it every day. I right? mean, look what we do, man. Yeah, tell yeah, me about this is, it. This is tough, yeah. tough work. I hear you. <laughs> really, but, really sweating here. But there's a but there's a lot of people who I think could relate where your quality of life just isn't the same. No, and, and I think that's to him. I mean, legitimately, you you went from New York where it's number one media market. He has everything he wants off the field he wants to do and, and as far as his fame and brand. But then you go to a smaller market city, it feels small. I mean, look, and look, again, I'm from Ohio. I'm from Columbus. I am you know, got drafted by the Browns. I love the Browns. It feels small. It felt small. When I got traded to the, the Broncos, I was like, oh, this, this, this feels bigger. Like, this feels kind of what I remember. Like, going from Notre Dame to Cleveland, it, it felt like a step down. So I'm sure he felt like that to some degree. And then with the way the season went – not being quite as involved, not being healthy. I mean, everything kind of amounted to him just having a, a forgettable year. And that's that's really what this year ended up being. One of those where, yeah, they they won the offseason, they won the Lombardi in the offseason, but ended up not amounting to anything. And and now we're just going to be looking at for another head coach. And I, I'm, I'm just not sure where you go at this point because whatever head coach they look for, I, I don't know how you have any confidence that at the first sign that we have a hard time making it through a few weeks or a difficult run of our schedule, that they're not going to fire me after one year. 